Hello, welcome to the Research Cat. In this episode, we're going to be looking at uh, how to read a research study and how to help organize and work uh, with information once you get beyond a, a certain point. If you're in this, on the screen now is EndNote. Um, EndNote is a way for indexing uh, research so that once you found it, you don't have to go find it again. It's an, I chose this one. There's a couple of different programs out there. Um, I wanted something that was going to be able to organize large amounts of research in a way that I would be able to customize on how I want to look at it. If I'm doing something on uh, pedagogy, I do not want to spend time going through 368 references. So there are 66 references that have to do with uh, looking at uh, pedagogy from a critical thinking standpoint. And when I found those articles, I would put them in. It also allows me to see whether they're a web page or a journal, whether it's a podcast, I have videos in here. And so anywhere I go out and I find something and I'm working on that particular research, I can go and help do it. This is um, how we're looking at change theory. This was specific to how to write a good dissertation um, and also be able to do the defense. If I'm looking at the IRB, uh, that's the Institutional Review Boards, I want to know and be able to find those regulations and be able to find them fast. And so that's a way to be able to organize research. And I'll come back to this in a moment. But the first thing that we have to start at is the difference between a literature review and a research study. Now it is possible that you'll go through a practice research study um, somewhere in your uh, bachelor's program, even a community college program in something such as psychology where, or education, where you'll go off and you'll interview some of the other people in your class You'll base that on what is out there in the literature and you'll say in your write-up of this, this is what I found. And you are doing research at that point, but you're not doing research that can be generalized and published because it's not going through a review process. The review process is uh, integral to being a credible researcher professionally. One of the things that people have in the end of high school, community college, or um, university, and depending on your master's program, you may or may not get into it. Um, typically at your master's program, you would at least touch on the, on the idea of what is a literature review. That is that you've gone out, you've looked at all the various literature that is out there in the field, and it could be a lot of it. And then you've decided I'm going to talk about this particular slice of the literature. Or a study where I'm going to go out and after I conduct that research, have a problem and address that problem through some sort of a study. And that's really what I wanna focus on in today's video. Now, we really have to start with ways that people do basic research. So I'm gonna start up here in uh, Google. I've been watching a lot of World of Warcraft, uh, excuse me, World of Warships videos uh, with the YouTuber uh, Mighty Jingles. And so I was curious about the Intrepid Carrier. If I just type in Intrepid, I'm going to end up with, first of all, way too many results. And my first couple things are not necessarily parts that will 
This is a museum of the Intrepid that is actually about the ship. And the reason for this is that most of these uh, search engines, and Google in particular, searches by money. So the more that you pay, um, that's one of the ways that it rises to the top. So there is a popularity form, but there's also a payment form. And that's why oftentimes advertisements will show up towards the top. You'll also get Wikipedia up at the top um, on these as well. And so I need to have some sort of a way to look at it. Now down here, I'll have information about the carrier. So I can click on Wikipedia and it will give me an overview of the carrier. Now, is this a credible source? And the answer is generally not, but it can be. Um, and I have pretty much constant fights sometimes with English instructors because they will say, well, you can't use Wikipedia at all. That's sort of true. Now, if it's their particular curriculum and they've set the rules, don't ever use Wikipedia, it's not worth fighting over. Just don't use it. But to say that it's never acceptable, I would uh, take issue with that. Well, I, I do take issue with that, <laughs> sometimes to their dismay. And the reason is, these are all the footnotes. I can go find out and say, I'd like to open this link in a new tab and see what that information is. And this came from a government website, which is generally credible and used for papers in the first two years of college. If what is said in here in this research areas and what is um, used said in the article is also out there in multiple other sources that I've used. This can't be my only source. But if I have multiple forms of research and it's still there, then it is potentially possible that this is an acceptable source to add a little bit more depth to it. Um, when a student comes and they're asking and they want to know about a question and they don't even understand what's going on, programming sometimes comes up with this with logic gates or quantum computers, you can come and you can get a decent amount of information and it's not serious research, but it does help you get quick information that then you can find more credible sources to use. The problem with Wikipedia is that anybody can go in and edit it. But that doesn't mean that it's useless to actual academic uh, fields. It just is not the most acceptable area. So I'm going to come over into Google Scholar and I'm going to look for um, articles that have to do with the Intrepid aircraft carrier. And I'm going to come up with 4,000 results. But what I'm really interested in is about case law that involves the aircraft carrier. So I'm going to come over to the case law and I'm going to put in the same one, and now I'm going to end up with case law on the aircraft carrier. And I'm going to have 25 cases. And if I go into these, I'll end up with, this was in the New York Supreme Court in 2003, and this was a uh, Uh, John Silvera versus the Intrepid Museum Foundation. And so it gives me some way of saying that I want to look at it and I'm saying I don't really want the museum, maybe I want this particular one. Well, this one was filed 
with the Navy. It was filed in Indiana of the North District, I believe. And so now I can look at this and say, is this something that I'm interested in looking at? What if I wanted to do the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier, but I'm interested now in something to do with its um, hydraulics? So I'm gonna put this in and then I'll go to hydraulics. Well, this gives me potentially 500 results that I could go to. And I've decided that in this particular one, this came out of mechanical engineering in 2012. So I click over here and I'm going to end up with a stub. And a stub is, it's essentially an abstract, which is over here. And on this abstract, it tells me the different versions that I can get. And I'm probably going to have to either buy it or log into their particular um, database that is carrying this mechanical engineering. Um, it sometimes bothers me when I see and this one looks like it has at least a portion of the article below it. It bothers me sometimes when people connect into the stubs rather than connecting into an actual article. So to make this easier for me, I see that it has a PDF associated with it. You click on the PDF off to the right and it will actually carry this particular article or flyer um, that was in it. And so I'm going to have various information. Now this is not the Intrepid aircraft carrier. It looks like it is actually the Intrepid hydraulics for the shuttle. So not going to be useful for what I'm exactly looking for, but it's interesting nonetheless. It's also not a research study. It's a magazine article. That doesn't mean it's useless. But I'm looking for something more carrier operations perhaps. So I'm going to come over to hmm. I'm looking for one that is not in HTML. Well, I'm still going to end up with uh, hydraulics. This is again with the space, but I'll take a look at it. This is from 1967, and it gives me a PDF that comes out of the NASA government archives. And if this was something that I'm looking for, this could be a very good, um, potentially, uh, source for especially a historical source. It's not on hydraulics for the aircraft carrier, so I'm not really going to be interested in it in my self-imposed assignment. But it will work for showing how we can use programs to organize our information relatively quickly. One thing to watch is that when you're doing serious, credible research, it's going to take a long time you're going to have to look through a number of different sources. And so perhaps Intrepid wasn't on the aircraft hydraulics, so I'm going to have to rerun that search a different way. This looks a little more interesting. This is the hydraulic gear that's going to stop planes from basically running off of the deck on their landing. So they're going to have in Computers and Fluids magazine a no, nope, not interested. They're going to have other articles that are related to it, and they're going to end up with this particular system. If I wanted to say, is this system on side relevant to that self-imposed research that I more or less made up as the video was running, I'd have to go off to the Intrepid Carrier and find out if it uses this model of hydraulics gear. And then I can say, oh, okay, it uses that hydraulics gear. This is something about an analysis of the hydraulics gear uh, in use. 
and now I can connect the two. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking this could be useful. I don't know if it is or not, but I'm going to go collect this information. So I'm going to put this into my research database. Now, when I come over into here on the APA, okay, and I have different versions that I can highlight, and these are different programs for it. I've seen people who simply take this, they copy it, I just control C it, take it over into Word, they paste it. Hello. And they end up with this and they get a list. And then they might even have a folder on their computer that has information and so they know that the author was Wang. They say that they'll uh, set it up so that they can go and find it in their folder. It's still a more complicated way of organizing literature. Now, if I only have three sources, this isn't so bad. However, if I'm doing more than three sources and I'm going to have, say, 50 or 60 or 100 sources, this is not the best way. Actually, it's not anything beyond five. I consider this to be, become more difficult than is needed. So instead, I'm going to come to the citation part, portion, highlight it. I'm in social sciences and education, so it's likely that I'm doing APA. But perhaps I was given research to give to someone for a uh, science treatment. That might then be Chicago. Chicago is typically used in the sciences. If you're looking at your Harvard style, which is in your humanities and your natural sciences. Uh, Vancouver is, I forget at this moment, what Vancouver is used for, um, but I would have that version that would be told. And you'd want to know what your versions is. MLA is typically in your English. There's a form out there called Terubian style that's in your histories. In this particular case, I'm going to use APA. And I'm going to click on EndNote and it will import it directly into the program that I have. That sets up this program. And if I come over into the preview, it gives me the entry. It already has the hanging indent, which is I need when I go into a, any sort of bibliography or references. And then it gives me the information and I can um, model that. Doesn't help me out unless I have the article as well. So I'm going to come over here to get the article download that article and say I'm going to save it. Make sure you know where you're saving it. I've got mine set up so it's going to save into my downloads. And I set it up through um, what it's named at. And then I click OK. I'm not going to bother reading it too much. We'll look at that in a moment to see if it's a research study, if it's a literature review, if it's going to work for my assignment. And then I can just back upwards so I don't lose my place on it because I have 21,000 results to go through. When I come over into EndNote, I'm going to attach that PDF. And I'm going to come down into my sources. These are the folders that I put down. This is for my 3D modeling and DAZ. This is educational cat which was the beginning before I became a research cat. This is Fallout 4 mods. Um, I'm doing some modding for Civilization so I have that. Um, any jobs that I'm looking for, the research cat folder. I have two temporary folders but instead of having temporary 1 and 2 I've just been using versions of temp. And now I'm doing mods for Sim 4 um, along with this is the actual scene library for uh, the 3D models for the roster. And now I'm going to come down into, and I have, I play World of Warcraft. Um, uh, I don't know why World of Warcraft is stuck in my brain. I've actually never played the game. <laughs> I've used, uh, but I like Warhammer 40k. 
So I ran across some of these and I downloaded them. This is the guy I'm interested in. I'm gonna open that up and I can preview it. Now when I go to the reference, the reference, the preview, and the actual article are all together. And if I want to look at that article enlarged, it's right there. This was done out of Iowa State and it gives me an abstract. When you're looking at a abstract, you do not want to be quoting from the abstract. The abstract is simply a summary. It's the same function as what's on the back of a book. Instead, you want to be looking at, is this something that in there will tell me this has to do with aircraft landing on an aircraft carrier deck? That's what I'm interested in. I think it's worth going down and seeing if this has information that's going to be useful to me. Now, if I'm in my first or second year of college, I don't really care if it's a study or if it's a literature review. So I'm also going to get a whole number of uh, words that I can use to further and uh, widen my scope of research for it. Uh, I have no idea what NURBS stands for at this moment. However, I might want to put that inside of uh, Google Scholar and see if that will come up with something that I want. Hydraulic arresting gear is I believe what I want, so I'm going to look at that. It's going to give an introduction. The introduction is going to be some sort of uh, why this is important and why the authors decided this was something important to look at. After I come through an introduction, depending upon how the research uh, article was derived or the literature review was derived, you'll have the introduction sometimes morphs into a literature review and is sometimes broken up separately. In this case, we have now the uh, research that continues. This is all things that are currently out there and they've received this information from somewhere and I should be able to find it. In this case, they describe it by citations and I can click on those citations here. Um, this is typical. It looks like it's in Chicago style because this is typical for your Chicago style. Um, after I get through, and I have to go back up, after I get through my literature review, it's now going to give me, and this continues the literature review, now it's going to give me simulations. Depending upon the research study methodology that is chosen, one possible way to do it is to have simulations of the gear before it's done, or this might have been simulations that they did, have I read it a little bit farther than just scrolling down, this might have been simulations that they did as part of the study itself. And it should describe exactly what is being done so that a, another researcher in the field who comes and says, I can do this same methodology, set it up and I should get data that is within the same area. And this looks like they are in fact uh, doing the study. They're doing simulations of the, of the study rather than actual putting all the material out there. They're doing it on a computer. They're running the simulations and they're finding out whatever the results are going to be. After we get done with the data analysis, and that's what this is, is this is a data analysis. Then we're going to have a conclusion. And the conclusion is usually something that is, this is what we found, this is what we still need work on. So they found that the FSI simulations produced rotor blade displacements are relatively low. Uh, compared to the device length scale, 
this needs to be investigated in future work. So if you're an engineer looking at uh, arresting gears for hydraulics, you might say, you know, this is something that I can now look at. And this is a, an important part that I think many people brand new to research didn't understand or don't understand. I didn't understand it when I first started is that I can't just say I'm interested in this. There has to be a reason why I'm interested in it and why it's worthy of study. And if I can't justify why it's worthy of study, then I have to go back to the information and find some way to um, reformulate that problem. It has to be scholars that are interested in the study. That doesn't mean that your study would never be able to work. It's that as a new researcher, someone new to the college scene, someone new to this investigation, why would they care? Right? If someone was to ask me, why am I interested in modeling hydraulic arresting gear and I want to be published ser seriously, I can't say because I watched something in a Mighty Jingles World of Warships video and thought, gee, I'd like to know that. I have to go find somebody who is actually in the field and is credible in that field that will ask me. Now, what might happen is they might end up contracting me to find information for them, right? And that may be my role as a researcher, doing work for somebody else, finding that information and then delivering it to them in a format that they can use. And so I might end up creating a group and I'm going to create a group down here that is called, I don't know, Hydraulic Gear. And so now I have this Hydraulic Gear here. I have one unfiled. That's the one we just put in. I'm going to drop it into Hydraulic Gear. And in reality, I don't need this. Um, I'm more interested in academic uh, adaptive hypermedia. That is machines and how they learn. I'm much more conversational about this and so this is more what I end up doing or college engagement. I'm very interested in why people, some people finish college, some people just aren't engaged, some people start college, they run into problems and then they end up leaving. So this is what I'd be more interested in but that doesn't mean that I would never come back to this. There might be something there that I will find myself coming back to at some point. Perhaps a, since they did simulations, I want to look at different ways people are simulating gear across different fields. In education, in computer programming, in hydraulic engineering. But let's look at right now something such as a typical research study in the education. And I think what we'll do is look at perhaps this one. So this is done, this is through the International Journal of Emerging Computer Science and Technology. And it's going to have an abstract and then it gives a some sort of keywords and then an introduction. The introduction and the related work to this is starts to form the literature review of why this is an important study to do. And that is your cognitive traits and educational philosophy is really where it starts the literature review. And you're going to be discussing various authors in the field who said this is an important thing to study. And typically a good literature review will go on for a while. And it may have multiple sections. It should have different areas of uh, research for it. It will have different ways we slice the problems up into smaller paths. 
you cannot take all the information on hypermedia learning machines and possibly put them into one paper. It's just far too many articles. So you're going to look at one small aspect of learning machines. Um, and in this one, it looks like a problem-based learning. Okay. Most of this research that I'm going through here and I'm looking at is in problem-based learning solutions. After the literature review comes down, you're going to end up with a methodology which will be usually between the literature review and the methodology is the research question. In this case, it's a problem statement. So they're looking at a two-part problem, right? They've split their thesis into two different areas. They want to investigate the number of cognitive traits and environmental context, and they want to look at design and implementation of an evolutionary algorithm that will generate instructional content. Um, and this goes back to learning preferences. A couple episodes ago, I did one on VARC, that's your visual audio, read, write, and kinesthetics. This is looking at it through problem-based learning and hypermedia. After you get this, you have methodology, which is spelled wrong. Um, but in methodology, you're going to have a some sort of um, straightforward way that other people, other researchers in the field can design the study so that it's replicable. A good research study is re replicable. If I was doing a research study on the pandemic that is currently in the United States, just because I find in a small population of 20 or 30 people some sort of um, advantage to perhaps a drug, if that can't be replicated with a similar population in multiple, uh, with multiple people, it's not really useful to me because it can't be generalized into the population. We don't know that the harm wouldn't uh, outweigh uh, the good. And there is a um, YouTuber, uh, Dr. Mike, I've used him before, and he has stated that this is sometimes a problem. People really don't understand the research studies and they just generalize it out into anything. Um, just because it was good for six people does not mean in any way that it's good for the entire population of the United States. And the same is true in education, that one of the bigger problems that happens is that people will take a small segment and they'll say, well, this study found whatever it found, and they'll generalize it out into the main population. And it's just, it's sloppy research. And one of the reasons I created the channel is to help uh, students not have sloppy research. After you've done the problem, you will typically have some sort of a um, data that is your data collection and your data analysis. After the data collection and data analysis are done, you'll have a conclusion. And then your conclusion is typically in two parts. One part is this is what I have found, and the other part is, this is what we need to do more of. I tell students that if they're going to use research studies and then they're in their bachelor's degree, typically they don't need to know about the data collection and the data analysis because they may not understand it. Um, that's usually based upon if it's in quantitative, some sort of statisticals and probability based. And if it's in qualitative, it has to do with coding, understanding uh, certain psychological terms. You still have probability. And I would suggest that pretty much anyone who wants to go into their master's takes a statistics course. Most people misunderstand probability. 
Now, not everything is going to be a research study. Um, let me look for, there's a computer for Muller. I have used him several times in looking at hypermedia. Here it is. And this was not a research study. This was an article that did a framework. That is, it was a research study, which I found to be very interesting, and then took this in a thought experiment and said, we have all this information out there, let's look at it a different way, and then perhaps call for a new set of research. And this is a good way of being able to move research from what is currently accepted into looking at it in a different way. Perhaps as a, um, as a scholar creating a research study, I want to create a research study to test this theoretical framework. And in fact, my uh, dissertation, I looked at a theoretical framework and did in fact do exactly that, test someone's theoretical uh, framework, which was actually Tinto's um, with the uh, process model of retention in colleges. So there's different ways that you can be able to get this research done. When you go to find your research, your research, if it's peer reviewed, you're in much better shape. I tell students that if they're looking and they have no idea where to even start it's not a bad thing to start in the dictionary, in Wikipedia, in your encyclopedias. Look in those areas first, but then go find actual research studies, literature reviews that talk about the articles. Research studies are fine. The literature review, which is in the first portion of a, um, of a study, is probably what you're looking for in actual fact. If you're looking at government documents, they're an excellent source for people. And then when you're putting your information together, you want to have some way of organizing that information so that you can find it again. Sometimes I work with students, they have really good ideas, and then I'll ask, well, where are your sources? Well, they can't find their sources and it takes them a really long time to set up their sources. Um, that's usually an organizational problem. And so being able to organize your work in such a way that you can find it easily. Do you have to use EndNote? No, I do. That doesn't mean that it's even the best way. But you want to have a efficient way to be able to find your articles, to be able to organize it. I could do this inside my downloads, set up a folder uh, typed research, and then have a long list, and maybe I'm going to cross-reference to those folders. That's one way to do it. I find that being having to flip through multiple windows at the bottom of the screen is annoying. Um, sometimes I'll see that people are on a laptop and they have 45 windows open at the top to the point that the laptop actually crashes and they lose their work that they had. So if I have more than three or four or five windows open at a time, then I have to go back and look at my efficiency because that means I'm spending more time doing the grunt work of getting the articles together than the writing work for it. And I personally do not really care for writing literature reviews. So I want to be able to write them in a fast, efficient way so that I can get to what I'm really interested in, which is the research problems and organizing um, and conducting a study. If you find that this is helpful or you find that there is something about this that you would like to know more about, please leave a comment below. You can give me a thumbs up if you found it useful. I can do later a 
uh, software and introduced this particular software. Um, I haven't talked to the company. I assume that they would be okay with me advertising their software. Um, but if you're interested in this particular product or a similar product, you can let me know. Next week, I want to look at critical thinking, um, particularly when we're doing critical thinking at, um, when we're looking at research, we're going to be using um, an author named Booth. And the title of the book is The Craft of Research, looking at understanding how to organize a problem and how to know if it's a problem that is suitable for research um, particularly when you're looking at your either your publications or a final project in a class uh, to try to help students out a little bit. Um, not really focused at this moment on the doctorate level research, which has a much higher criteria and bar than the typical research where I'm more interested in, in helping students in their first and second and third years of college and getting that solid foundation together. Um, if you're spending your first couple years of college and you're not really understanding how to put together a research study, how to put together a literature review, what are the differences between a literature review and a research study, then you really um, don't have a very stable foundation. And I find that, yes, some students don't like to study, but in general, most of the students that I work with, they really are interested in studying. They are very inefficient at it at times, and so they work really hard and they learn a lesson, but they don't necessarily learn the lesson that the teacher means. They might learn the lesson that I get the same grade whether I work hard or not, so what's the point of working? Well, that's as an instructor, that's not what I want my students to be learning. So that's what this is focused on. And then the third in this uh, little trilogy of research um, studies on research articles has to do with how I would go about organizing a paper uh, for a research study and we'll be coming back to this program so that this program connects into Word um, So that when you're over here in Word um, I'll actually open up a different version because I have Grammarly available there as well um, Along with the EndNote tab and that I'll be, I'll be able to show a little bit more Not everybody will need Grammarly. I do it because I do quite a bit of writing and as I write fast sometimes it catches all the little errors that might uh, creep up in my typing. And so I wanna make sure that I'm typing correctly for it. As always, you can uh, let me know how I'm doing and I will see you next week. Take care.